Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you please take your seats in the room. Welcome to the panelists. Welcome to you all in the room. Kia ora koutou katoa. Welcome to this session on uh, addressing terrorist and violent extremist content online. Uh, my name is Jordan Carter. I'm from Internet New Zealand, and it is my job today to moderate uh, this esteemed panel. Um, and we are going to do our best to make sure there's plenty of time for audience engagement and interaction. So, and we have our final panelist just joining us, which is fantastic. And I'll run you very briefly through. Hi. Good morning, Jordan. I'll run you very briefly through to start the format of today's um, session. Um, the, we'll have a very brief intro where each of the panelists will introduce themselves. We will then see a video from the New Zealand Prime Minister uh, contextualizing the session. And then we'll have two main blocks of content, if you like. The first is on responsibilities and responses, and that addresses two of the policy questions for today. The question is, what are the responsibilities that the various stakeholders have to each other? Uh, and what responses are they making to the problem of violence and terrorist extremist content? The second block is about rights and risks. And we'll start off with a, a presentation on the human rights implications of this kind of content and what risks there are from action to tackle it. And then we will have a block that we think will be about 20, 25 minutes for audience um, interventions. And we will close by asking each of the panelists to give us some input on the two sort of closing policy questions. What are your policy recommendations for dealing with this content going forward? And what role can the IGF ecosystem play in making progress on these issues? Uh, and of course, the topic is terrorist and violent extremist content. Uh, the internet, as we are probably mainly convinced in this room and in this event, is an amazing force for good. Um, and one of the things that it allows is rapid uh, communication. Uh, and there's been a huge proliferation of various social networking and other forms of platform that allow very quick dispersal of lots of content, user-generated content, to large audiences at high speed. Um, and we have seen there are incidents of problematic content, and the focus here is on violent and terrorist extremist content. Um, as a New Zealander, we had a very um, challenging experience with that at the start of this year after the terrorist attacks on two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, where 51 people were killed out of the 100 who were shot. Uh, in a country of 5 million people, that's the same death rate as the, um, the attacks in New York in September um, 2001. So it had quite a profound impact on us, and it saw um, the internet being used in a new way um, to disperse problematic content much more quickly and at a much higher scale than had been done before. So that's uh, a piece of context that I, I have and carry with me, and that's why I was interested in moderating this, this session today. Um, so if I could just run down the panel briefly and ask you to spend 10 or 20 seconds just introducing yourselves to the audience, and then we'll do the video, and then we'll come back to the substantive um, interventions. So if you'd like to grab a microphone and just say your name and organization, okay. that would be great. Okay, thank you. And uh, my name is Edison Lanza. I'm the Special Rapporteur of Freedom of Expression in the Inter-American System of, of Human Rights. I'm Sherry Clark. I'm from the U.S. Department of State, Bureau of Counterterrorism. And my um, topic is counterterrorism-related cyber issues, particularly countering the use of the Internet for terrorist purposes. Hi, I'm, I'm Brian Fishman. I lead Facebook's efforts against what we call dangerous organizations, which are terrorist organizations, hate groups, large-scale criminal organizations, etc. Uh, my background is as an academic studying terrorism and, and the people that became ISIS in particular. Hi, I'm Yudan Javijaratna. I'm a data scientist with LearnAsia. I'm also the founder of Watchdog, which is a fact checker founded in the wake of the recent Sri Lankan terror attacks. Kia ora tato katoa. My name is Paul Ash. I'm from the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet in New Zealand. So uh, the Prime Minister you're about to hear from, I, I work for. And um, my area of work is around national security policy with a particular focus on uh, cyber security and digital uh, national security issues. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. My name is Courtney Gregoire, and I serve as the Chief Digital Safety Officer for Microsoft, uh, really setting the policy to address illegal and harmful content across our product and services. So, hello, everyone. So, my name is Impil Choi from South Korea, is uh, Kakao. So, today so I will talk about uh, Korea and our company's policy for the, the we the corporate the, the, the for the, our today's agenda. Thank you. Yes, good morning. My name is uh, Gerd Billen. I'm a State Secretary uh, in the Ministry of Justice and Consumer Protection. Uh, one of my duties is uh, to uh, monitor social media activists um, and try to prevent terrorism, but also to combat terrorism. Um, and I think it's an important discussion uh, today that you've organized. Um, <clears throat> I'm K.S. Park, a uh, law professor at Korea University. Uh, studying freedom of speech. Also a uh, director at OpenNet Korea. I was one of the main directors of uh, the Manila principles for intermediary liability, which I think will be relevant for this discussion. Thank you uh, very much to all the panelists for those introductions. Uh, my job as moderator is to make sure we stick to time. So if we get caught up in the rush and talking too much, I might come and loom behind you. I, I may even put my hand gently on your shoulder to remind you to stop speaking, and then I'll make a cutting noise and your microphone will be cut off. So <laughs> those, those are, it's an escalation process, clear terms of service, community standards, and so on. Um, so we will open, the New Zealand Prime Minister, we, we invited her to come to this panel in person. She couldn't make the travel schedule work, but she did um, record a video to contextualize the panel, and if we could play that now, that would be great. Kia ora koutou katoa. The internet is a powerful force for good. It has an extraordinary power to connect us all, communities and individuals, economically, culturally and socially. Part of what I understand this panel will discuss is this power for good, the ability to share ideas and values on a scale that we have never seen before. The internet and information communications technologies empower all of us. But this speed and this reach is not always unqualified good. We in New Zealand saw this vividly illustrated earlier this year when the horror and fear and trauma of the Christchurch terrorist attacks was magnified by the live streaming of the attack. The internet and social media was weaponized as part of this attack with deliberate efforts to make the video go viral and to subvert efforts to find and to remove it. Now most of all you know about our response, founded on a shared view of the harm that this content can cause. In partnership with France, we in New Zealand established something called the Christchurch Call to Action to eliminate terrorist and violent extremist content online. This is a voluntary and collaborative effort to address the harms this material can cause while preserving a free, open and secure internet and protecting human rights and fundamental freedoms. Now, I'm really proud of the progress that we have all made under the call. We have over 40 countries supporting the call along with some of the world's biggest tech companies, all acknowledging this is not a problem we can solve alone. We also have a Christchurch Call Advisory Network with civil society groups, non-government organisations, researchers and others able to provide guidance on these tricky issues. And these are shared complex issues. New Zealand and others work on the Christchurch Call is situated in the context of a range of really challenging issues related to online content. And while we saw the worst of terrorist and violent extremist content after Christchurch, this sits against a backdrop of increasingly difficult issues related to the spread of problematic content generally online, from hate speech to misinformation. Now, as New Zealand, we are a small country. Like any other state, we can regulate within our borders, but we cannot solve global problems on our own. There are some things that shape how we can approach these issues together, including on forums like the Internet Governance Forum. For me, some of these are respect for international law, including international human rights law, but also other frameworks such as international counter-terrorism law. Secondly, maintaining a free, open, interoperable global internet so we can retain the benefits of connectivity. 
Thirdly, collaboration and consultation, including the need for government, civil society and tech companies to work together, something I think we need more of. The Christchurch Call to Action has been just that, a call to action. We've established new relationships and made commitments to try to better prevent and respond to terrorist and violent extremist content online. Changes such as the evolution of the Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism into a standalone entity will also make it easier for us to work together. But there is still more work to be done, both here in New Zealand and overseas. Thank you to all of you who are engaging in these debates and these discussions. It is a brave new world that we live in. Together though, I do believe we can face head on the challenges of our time. Nūreira, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, thank you. So, so the Prime Minister was able to highlight the work that New Zealand has done with the Christchurch Call. If it's a document you're not familiar with, you can find it online. Um, and I'm sure that Mr. Ash from the New Zealand government will be addressing some of that content in his remarks shortly. So the first part of our discussion is on rights and sorry, on responsibilities and responses. We're going to open with Dr. Park speaking on the topic of the different responsibilities of the different stakeholders. So the floor is yours, sir. Uh, because I was uh, uh, abundantly warned about the time limit, uh, I'll just read from a prepared statement to, to make the uh, presentation short. Violent extremist content is a misnomer. There is a lot of uh, extremely violent content online or offline. Uh, Look at the games that kids play. Um, remember the movie, A Clockwork Orange? Um, the US Supreme Court already said that animal cruelty videos in the Stevens decision and violent video games in the Brown decision uh, cannot be banned for content. Content can be banned only for its external harms that are necessary to prevent, uh, to keep or maintain a democratic society. In the context of uh, the examples uh, that Prime Minister uh, uh, talked about, I believe that what we really mean by uh, violent extremist content is hate speech. Uh, I believe we should couch the discourse, or this discourse, comfortably in the discourse of a hate speech regulation which we have understood and written so eloquently and abundantly. Having said that, do we even understand hate speech regulation so well? Questions remain. United Nations norms define hate speech as advocacy of uh, discrimination and hostility across the national, religious, and racial lines. But what does hostility mean? Uh, is causing a hostile mindset a sufficient basis? Why not count the chilling effect on vulnerable hearers of speech count as harm justifying regulation? Should counter speech of a minority also count as hate speech when their speech doesn't have that <clears throat> electrifying effect, the, the effect of electrifying the pre existing oppressive, oppressive uh, social system permissive of discrimination and hostility? And, and therefore, uh, counter speech uh, is not likely to cause discrimination and hostility that justifies regulation. How about joining an organization that advocates for discrimination and uh, hostility instead of uh, advocating uh, itself, uh, ad advocating for, uh, ad uh, uh, instead of advocating for such things uh, by uh, themselves? And what are the responsibilities of a uh, platform. I think I threw more questions than answers, so I think that's a good start. Thank you for a provocative and interesting beginning to the, to the discussion. Um, and uh, on this stage, the, the interventions to come uh, come from the various different stakeholder groups. We have some people from companies, we have some people from governments, we have some people from civil society here on the stage. And what I'd encourage you to just try and tease out if in your discussion, if you can, is both the, the things that you see your sector or area of this debate being responsible for, 
And if you've got any views that might be controversial or interesting about what other stakeholders should do as well, hopefully we can provide lots of uh, food for thought and, and debate with the audience. So we're going to start with um, some government representatives. And uh, Paul Ash from New Zealand, would you like to say a few words? Thanks, Jordan. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, you've obviously already heard from the Prime Minister um, uh, a, a, a key perspective, which is that New Zealand, uh, in responding to what happened in Christchurch, did not believe that it could act alone. Uh, we could quite readily have regulated and legislated. We could have done that at speed. Uh, but after what happened in Christchurch, we felt the need to take stock and to think rather carefully about the options we had uh, for dealing with an event that was unprecedented in its scale. And that required of us that we uh, worked through um, some of the perils of um, short, sharp regulation and eschew that in favour of a collaborative uh, approach that would leave us, by the time we did need to think about regulation, better informed about what was possible um, uh, through voluntary collaboration and better informed about the remaining areas where we might need to regulate. And in taking that approach, we were very much of, uh, um, of, the, of the mind or of the thinking that um, we're working in uh, difficult, um, uncharted territory uh, where um, work like legislation can have quite significant unintended consequences unless it's well uh, grounded in a discourse that includes uh, a wide range of parties. The alternative for us then was what became the Christchurch call, taking a targeted and focused um, piece of uh, uh, work uh, that was focused in on the proximate issue that we saw, that of someone uh, murdering 51 people peacefully at worship and live streaming that across the world. In doing so, we saw it was essential to work with the companies uh, whose platforms had been abused to uh, transmit that. We saw it as essential to work with close partners amongst other governments. Uh, who had a similar set of concerns around public safety and the impacts of that event. Uh, and we saw it as really important to reach out to understand what we knew was a very diverse set of views in civil society from uh, 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 the freedom of expression uh, perspective at one, en one end, in a sense, and right at the other, um, the, the, the groups that were looking to represent the rights of the victims in this, in this instance, and that we would need to find a way to bring that together into one construct. That led to the Christchurch call, uh, and it led to the content of that call, which sets out some actions for governments um, that include the traditional roles and responsibilities of government, regulation, uh, public safety, upholding the social contract and trying to ensure uh, that in um, uh, the kinds of liberal democracies that um, New Zealand um, uh, sought uh, to work with on this, uh, respect for international law, respect for human rights law, respect for counter-terrorism law sat at the, at the heart of the work we did. It also required um, um, working with companies on the things that they should be delivering and how they should be thinking, first of all, about implementing their own community standards uh, and about how they might use tools that would uh, prevent the spread of that kind of contact. Finally, uh, the key thing out of the Christchurch call was the need to work together on things we did jointly. And in a sense, that's where um, the real rub point on this has been uh, and where I think we have uh, spent a lot of time learning and I think companies have as well uh, and had civil society um, um, engagement has, has um, produced lessons for us too. Um, there is no Babel fish that translates between those parties at the moment. Um, there is just a need for some uh, really hard graft um, trying to understand the different vocabularies we speak and that's what we're in the midst of right now, including on this panel. Thank you, um, Paul. Um, our next uh, intervener is um, State Secretary Billen from Germany. Please take the floor. What is the aim of that kind of extremism? What are the goals? And what you find out is uh, there are well-financed financed Isla Islamic, but also uh, right uh, extremistic groups who try to destroy our democracy, who try to destroy our pluralistic approach to people who are living here. And the way they are trying to destroy the society 
is by attacking people. Not everybody, but journalists, especially female journalists, local mayors, people who are engaged in civil society, but also people who are re representing different kinds of re religions. They want to silence that kind of people. They want to, that people stop using their right of free speech. And uh, that was for us the, the start of thinking, what can we do against that kind of attack to our society? We had talks and we have talks to social uh, media platforms, to civil society and uh, to other partners. And when we started in, uh, a couple of years ago, we asked the, uh, the social media platforms, what, what is your task? What are you doing? In these times, and maybe, and I think that have changed, in that times, the social media platforms uh, find themselves, they are tech companies, and they are working on economic issues. They are, e they are companies. And we find out, and I think that's a shared kind of, a uh, uh, shared idea now, they are not only an economic working company, not only a business, they, they have direct effects to our democracy and the way we live together. Because some, some kind of misuse or use, uh, that's uh, something we, we could uh, discuss, uh, of that platforms are affecting us in our daily life. And then we ask them, what, what are you doing? And they told us they will delete hate crime. We are, in Germany, we, we are talking about hate crime, not hate speech. It's not forbidden to, to, to hate somebody. It's not forbidden that I tell you I hate you. But in, in, if I, if, uh, if I are, um, have uh, affecting the criminal law, that's something different. So we are talking about hate crime. In Germany, for example, it's forbidden to deny the Holocaust. You can say ne Holocaust never happened, but then you, uh, we will bring you to court and you have to pay or you go to prison if you uh, don't uh, stop it. So we asked them, what are, what are you doing? And they, they told, uh, have told us two things. First, they have uh, community standards, very good community standards. Um, that's their, uh, that's their basis for delete uh, content. And they will delete criminal content within 24 hours. And then we make a kind of mystery complaining. We have the, we, uh, uh, we get money to an organization, uh, to uh, an organization that has a reputation as uh, a trusted flagger who, who know what, what really is a substantial complaint. Um, and they test it. When they send a complaint to Facebook, Twitter, and Google as a, a trusted flagger, the response was quite good. They delete it. But if I do the same as a normal citizen, there was nearly no reaction. And they shows us what they have promised they didn't fulfill. And then we start uh, our um, uh, in creating a kind of, we call it network enforcement um, a law. And the, the law obliges the social media platforms to inform us um, uh, and, and to build up transparency. How many complaints do they receive? How many complaints do they delete? What are the reasons they are deleting uh, complaints or the reasons why they don't delete it? Uh, we ask for, uh, for figures and information. Do they have an, an appropriate complaint management system? Um, because um, at the beginning, for example, my impression was uh, that the uh, complaint management system uh, of Twitter was uh, nearly zero. Uh, they didn't spend enough money and people and, and, uh, uh, and advice and, and knowledge uh, in, in cleaning up their platform. <coughs> and we took, we took a clear decision. The basis for deleting content in German has to be our criminal law community standard, I mean, no parliament ever has decided is it appropriate or not. It's a kind of private law. But in our, in our democracy, nobody can set private rules, private law. That's up to the parliament. So the, the network enforcement law is about, um, it's about uh, increasing transparency on, on what pl platforms are doing, but also to ensure that in cases where uh, content is uh, violating criminal law, it has to be uh, deleted. 
what we see now is the network uh, enforcement law could be, could be contribute uh, to a better understanding, but also to a better monitoring of the activities. Uh, we are now uh, together with the French government in, in uh, developing ideas that we want to uh, deliver to the European Union, because we think the European Union is the adequate level uh, to uh, develop that, that kind of um, of rules and activities. And the uh, European Union has uh, promised to, to set up a digital service act. And uh, I think it will, it will have another understanding than the, than the e-commerce guideline. The e-commerce guideline uh, that we have in Europe is about notice and take down, but responsibility is more than notice and, and take down. Uh, second part, we have uh, to spend more attention to the victims more support for the victims. Uh, because um, many victims uh, who uh, get threatened by, uh, not only in the, in the net, but also in the reality, when they go to the police, police don't have, don't understand what's going on. They say it's just on the internet. Uh, don't, uh, that, that's, not, that's, not as, uh, that's not a problem. But we have now uh, some very bad uh, experience in Germany in, 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 uh, in uh, the early summer of this year, a civil servant in, in a part of Germany was, was shot down, was murdered by somebody uh, who got his information and, uh, through the internet and who was, let's say, who had a kind of radicalization through the net. So uh, victims, it's not only about deleting uh, content, it's also about to support people. Some of the journalists, for example, have to leave their home because they find a picture of their front door of their home in the internet. Uh, the second is um, to improve our knowledge about the, 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 the um, perpetrators in the net. Who are the people, who are, who are the organizations, and who are they working? Uh, what is, you're looking to the, the watch? Yeah. I'll finish soon. Yeah. Because what we see in Germany, there are not uh, millions of Germans uh, using or misusing Facebook, Twitter, or Google. There are less, uh, but we don't have enough knowledge how they work. We know, we, we think it, it's, uh, there are ma mainly only, only two or four, uh, two, three, four thousand people in Germany active as part of that kind of, of uh, network try, that try to destroy the, uh, uh, our, our society. That's the short, uh, the short version. Um, um, and uh, I'm really um, interested to hear about the experience of networks, but also civil society organizations, because there is still an ongoing discussion in Germany, and that's about the, the relationship between um, um, enforcement um, and, uh, um, and uh, maintaining freedom of speech, not only in the internet, but also on the streets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our third government speaker is Dr. Shari Clark from the United States. Please go ahead. Thank you, and I have to apologize in advance. I've developed a cold, so my voice is not <clears throat> very good. I hope you can understand me. <clears throat> I wanted to just say a few words on behalf of the U.S. government to explain a bit our approach to this issue. Um, <laughs> thank you. The U.S. approach is a comprehensive and whole-of-society approach. Uh, we are... We've tried hard to focus not only on short-term removals of content, but also on building long-term resilience to the, pro to the terrorist messages. <clears throat> Our policy remains consistent with long-standing guiding principles. <clears throat> First, the U.S. Constitution and our strong commitment to um, freedom of expression, which is um, implemented through the First Amendment, informs any conversation or any approach we have to this issue, as well as our international commitments and obligations to human rights. We continue to be proactive in our efforts to counter terrorist content online, and that includes um, activities that facilitate terrorism, while also respecting human rights, such as freedom of expression. However, U.S. law enforcement does not compel the removal of content online unless it clearly violates U.S. law, and that includes things such as child sexual exploitation. Um, and content that promotes an ideology or belief alone, and that includes actually a lot of especially extremist 
or even violent extremist content does not necessarily violate U.S. law. Those things um, are protected under the U.S. Constitution. The second guiding principle I want to, to mention, and I will um, say that that adds, that follows on the first, which is that we rely actually on strong voluntary collaboration with technology companies for other types of content. <clears throat> and that is instead of, at this time at least, new regulations or specific removal guidelines, we encourage technology companies, of course, to um, enforce their own terms of service, which typically do prohibit the use of their platforms for terrorist content or terrorist activities. We also strive <clears throat> to improve our own information sharing with the companies, uh, we and other governments, to improve the information sharing on things like U.S. designated terrorist and general terrorist trends and tactics to help them enforce their terms of service better. And while much remains to be done, we do think we are making progress. We would point to not only specific um, activities, increased in expansion of terms of service and also implementation of those by companies specifically, but also the industry-led Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism and its partnership with the UN-affiliated Tech Against Terrorism. And not only their work to work together with research and technology to prevent the exploitation of their platforms for terrorist purposes, but also their assistance to smaller companies, which sometimes don't even have a terms of service or even understand that terrorists are exploiting their platforms. Third and finally, I'll just mention mm -hmm. uh, that we continue to maintain that the most effective means to counter terrorist and other objectionable content online is not through censorship or repression, but through more speech that promotes tolerance. <clears throat> we emphasize the importance, therefore, of credible alternative narratives as the primary means by which we can undermine and defeat terrorist messaging. And in the United States, we think that it's very important to build long-term resilience, I've said this before, to terrorist messages by cultivating specifically critical thinking skills and online public safety awareness, doing that through education and through community engagement. And that includes, very importantly, civil society, companies, communities, and all the other stakeholders on this issue. We also recognize that banning offensive speech can be counterproductive to our efforts. It can raise its profile. It can also drive it into darker places and, in fact, undermine our counterterrorism efforts. We have seen, finally, counterterrorism being used by some governments as a pretext to crush political dissent or other uh, activities that they deem objectionable. And I would note here that we've been speaking with, in the broader context of terrorist or violent extremist content, um, right-wing, or as we've been calling it, racially or ethnically motivated terrorism. We're working on that, how to define that. Um, some former uh, members of those groups. And they have told us specifically that government censorship is one of their best recruiting tools because it reinforces their narrative of government uh, persecution and oppression. Finally, of course, the uh, international collaboration, such as this forum, is very helpful in addressing this problem. And I will just, before I close, mention that um, on the issue of violent extremism, violence, extremism, the many definitional issues which we face, which is a huge part of the issue, the problem, that we do separate hate speech in the United States. We separate hate speech from uh, violent extremism. The point for us is focusing on violence, calls for violence. We, as U.S. government, do not want to be in the position of policing thoughts or speech unless it is actually crossing a line calling for violence. And of course, other. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you. And thank you to those three government speakers for exhibiting three quite different approaches to, to this area, both in the sort of responsibilities that you see, what your constitutional and legal frameworks provide for, and where you locate responsibility for tackling it. I think that's been a very interesting exposition. Um, we're going to flick now to three um, private sector perspectives. Um, and we'll start with Yunpil Choi from Kakao. Um, if you could try and keep your uh, interventions brief, we can get ourselves back on track time-wise. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jordan. 
And the people we discuss for this agenda, we should understand for the each companies and the each government, each country, <clears throat> um, uh, the cultural and uh, the social context. So the, briefly, we introduce our company. So we are the platform company that provide the social the media platforms, uh, the mobile messenger, and the portal service. So. Kakao and the Korean the internet company have obligations to self-regulate regulate as your service provided and have a duty to cleanse our the content environment. So the, we are trying to put in our the best efforts the, to the protect the user by the the harmful contents in the stage of the login the make uh, account and the create the contents and the, even though the profile that we trying to the protect in the advanced stage. So although the legal strength and the force of the government um, is very high in Korea, so the Korean internet companies um, that establish our policy the, through the KISO, we call it KISO, the KISO, um, the Korean Internet Self, the governance organizations, and so the, actually the civil bills um, to protect the users were the voluntarily the, the initiated the, through the KISO. And, uh, I think that the most important for the prevent all the spread of the Dutch contents. Um, the user the voluntary the participation is also important. And so Kakao to provide the user reporting the function in all the more services. So the user, user can immediately immediately the report and excuse for those contents. And so we encouraging the user to participate in this action so the protecting the harmful contents, the educate so about uh, the right to digital literacy and the campaign to create a healthy environment. And we also provide uh, the portal service. It's a similar service, the Yahoo. Um, so especially on the new sections, uh, so for exchange the uh, opinion and the expression be between the users, so we provide the comment service. But the civil and critical the social problem lies the caused by the, the unhealthy users. So it's a kind of the, such as the swelling, the inserting, and the degradings. So we could not overlook, overlook just overlook the social risk and the, the side effect derived from the, the comment service. So we officially announced the the abolition of the common service and uh, so on the entertainment news first. And the second step is a reformation on the related the service. Um, and so we also try to the, the respond rapidly the, the social the changes and the reflect the user the diverse voices. And while, while, while the securing the user rights, and to, to, to find the ways to more the, establish a better and the safe environment, internet environment. And therefore, the, we are the f fulfilling for the, our social the responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Brian Fishman, who I think is wearing two hats today, GIFCT and Facebook. Yes, uh, th thank you, Jordan, and thanks, thanks to everyone for having me here today. Uh, I, what, I, what I'll do very quickly is describe uh, Facebook's approach to these issues, uh, and then as the current chair of the Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism, talk about the GIFCT, uh, and I'll focus there primarily because um, this is one of the major initiatives that I think many of the stakeholders in the room are focused on at the moment. And we're in a moment of transition with the GIFCT, and, and so there's a lot to discuss in terms of where the organization is headed. So first, uh, on Facebook's approach, um, we have a set of policies around what we call dangerous organizations, which are terrorist organizations, um, hate organizations, and large-scale criminal groups. Um, and, and really our work in, uh, in relation to these groups uh, happens in, in sort of five 
five vectors. The first is the enforcement of our community standards, which is terms of service. Um, the, the second is how we engage law enforcement, both in response to, to requests for information and when we see uh, credible threats of violence, how do we manage that? The third is support for counter speech. And we have a number of programs um, to support uh, civil society efforts to push back on these hateful and extremist messages. Uh, the fourth is, is really to look after um, Facebook people that are engaged in this. And that can both be in the real world, but also developing programs and systems for people that are dealing with hateful and, and sometimes very violent and ugly content on a regular basis um, uh, to make that, uh, that process safer and easier for them. And then the last one is how do we engage the rest of industry and support the rest of industry, um, hopefully both by providing some tools, um, but also you know, this is an area that is beyond competition now for many in industry. So we want other platforms to learn from both our successes and our failures. Um, my team sits at the center of Facebook's efforts to do these five things. Um, but there are lots of teams that work on this. There are our engineering teams and our operational teams. There are folks that, that, that focus on just writing policy all day. My team is a little bit unique in that it's, we've brought in a series of folks from outside of Facebook that have some sort of expertise in these areas. And our job is to coordinate those different efforts across the company and be real inside voices as subject matter experts um, uh, to, to try to coordinate and drive those efforts. Overall though, Facebook has more than 350 people globally whose primary job is dealing with terrorism or hate organizations. That's separate from the more than 15,000 people at Facebook that review content uh, on a regular basis. Um, the scale is extraordinary, and I want to point to that because it is a really deep challenge that I think is underestimated by almost everybody that's not uh, focused on this inside one of these companies. I didn't understand this. I was one of the very first people that was really studying the people that became ISIS in depth. Much of that research happened online in 2005, 2006, 2007. I've been studying these things for a long time. I did not appreciate the scale at which social media companies operate and the challenges operationally that are surfaced when you're trying to manage this kind of content at that scale. And I really want to impress on everyone in the room to think about it. This year, in the last six months, ending in when? Uh, end of October, the six months ending in October. At Facebook, we removed more than 10 million pieces of content for violating our, poli our, for violating our policies around terrorism specifically. The scale is just massive. Now our policy is very blunt. We don't allow the praise, support, or representation of groups that we consider dangerous organizations. But we do allow, in some circumstances, propaganda produced by even a group like ISIS, if it is shared by a media organization or something like that. Scaling decisions globally when you're trying to take, into context, take context into account, when you're working in different languages, different cultural contexts, um, is extremely difficult. It's hard for human beings. It's even harder for machines. So we use some pretty sophisticated machine learning and AI it isn't perfect. We were just talking about some of the limitations in certain languages. Um, so I think that this is something that I really want to impress on everyone, and it's one of the reasons why our policies operate globally. The reason why this is important in the context of this conversation is that scaling an enforcement infrastructure, if we are going to be responsive to national level legal structures for our how many countries in the world are there today? A lot, 200-ish? Um, is going to be extraordinarily difficult to do that well. And I think this is a real challenge that we all face. And as we have this conversation, I, I, I want to keep that forefront. Now, turning to the GIF CT, that's the last point that I said um, is part of the Facebook effort, is the support for industry and, and the Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism. Just a level set, because some folks in the room probably understand what the GIF CT is, others probably don't. The Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism Counterterrorism was formally, um, formally uh, instituted a little over two years ago, but it built on the back of a lot of informal conversations among uh, technology platforms around terrorism that went back several years before that. But we, we instituted the GIF-CT 
Um, uh, this, this was Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Google, and Twitter, initially to share best practices and worst practices, to get together and talk about these issues. Over time, we began sharing something called hashes, or hashes of known terrorist content. A hash is like a digital fingerprint. This crowd probably understands that better than most I talk to. Um, what we've learned, in large measure, um, and what was reinforced, I think, after the Christchurch attack in, in particular, um, and, and the efforts uh, around the Christchurch call, were that, um, that it was time to step up some of these efforts. That we needed to be able to cooperate more effectively in a crisis moment when an attack in the real world went viral online. We responded and we coordinated to try to identify the, the terrible virality of the video of the Christchurch attack, and eventually we got our, our arms around it. Um, but this was an illustration where better coordination, um, and, and, and not even coordination, but just understanding when we needed to speak to each other and, and what were the right ways to do that, setting some protocols for having those conversations. Um, was really valuable. And so what we've decided to do is establish the GIF CT as an independent NGO. This is a real pivot point for the, for the effort in the organization. Um, we are in the midst of this process as we speak. Um, the, literally, the lawyers are finalizing the documents that we will sign to establish a, an independent organization. We will then go into the process of hiring an executive director who will lead the, the effort to hire staff. Um, the, the core industry supporters of this um, will provide the, uh, the funding for this organization. Um, and I want to talk about this in really two ways. Well, you know, A, Brief, briefly. what is the... Yeah. Go fast? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, will I, was, I want to talk about this in two ways very quickly. Um, the, uh, is governance and then operations. The governance of this is, this is still going to be an industry-led, primarily for industry entity. But when we're talking about a national security issues like this, we want to make sure that we have formal input from governments and from people that represent those institutions. And so we've structured an advisory structure to incorporate some governments into that, into that effort. We want to make sure that those are governments that respect human rights. And so we've, we've said that they need to be members of the Freedom Online Coalition. At the same time, and this is really key, we want to make sure that we aren't having a bunch of conversations just with governments behind closed doors. And so we want to build structures so that civil society is in those meetings, having those conversations with us, serving as a balance because these conversations need to happen. Some of these conversations need to happen in small rooms so we can make decisions, but they need to happen where there are people that can serve as constructive checks on one another. That's the governance idea. We're really trying to institute that, so this is way easier said than done. And we've been having a lot of, you know, tough conversations over exactly how to do this. But that's the idea we're trying to get at. The third thing, or the last thing here, is just what do we want to do with this organization uh, operationally? Well, we want to continue some of the things that are working well. We run good, effective training programs for smaller platforms, helping them think through what are terms of service, how do they operate, how can you approach, diff what are the different kinds of machine learning and AI, how do you train reviewers and build those kinds of systems, what are the sorts of things you can do to protect the mental health of those people that are doing those kinds of things, that, and that kind of work. That's one. We want to continue the technical cooperation. Um, by sharing hashes and doing that kind of work, facilitating um, smaller companies to understand when a crisis is ongoing. They don't have the teams that are able to monitor the globe in the way that Facebook or Microsoft or others do. Um, and the last one is we want to sponsor research because we sure don't have all the answers, and neither do the governments. Um, and, and so we want to sponsor good research by good academics to get some of these things done. Um, so I'll end it there because we, we don't have a lot of time, but the last thing I just want to remind everybody of is that as a professor of terrorism, I, I, counterterrorism, I study this and taught at, uh, uh, in a variety of different universities. Um, and we have to remember that terrorism is a strategy of the weak. Terrorists, the strategy that they aim to pursue is to provoke us into making mistakes, to provoke us into either overreacting or reacting in ways that aren't inconducive to our long-term interests. And the core thing we all have to do as societies 
in order to prevent that is not talk about what we're against, but understand very clearly what we are for. And um, as we think about regulation, as we think about this conversation generally, what is it that we all stand for? Um, and, and ground our, our policies around terrorist actors in that idea. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, the two hats. Um, the third um, company's speaker is Courtney Gregor from Microsoft. Hi there. Well, I want to find just a little perspective, and I, I know we want to be able to have a conversation today. Um, I want to share uh, that the topic here we're talking about is responsibilities and responses in the context of terrorism and violent extremism. For the Microsoft hat, uh, I think you're probably aware that Microsoft is a company that offers a wide range of product and services. And that gives us a lens into the need for clarity about when we're trying to, to articulate the problem statement and the risk in this issue area, and then how we define responsibilities appropriately across that. I'll explain a little bit more what I mean, but I'll step back and say as the Chief Digital Safety Officer, what we think about in this area of illegal and harmful content is how we are thinking about advocacy, internal policy, and then of course uh, the tech and tools to enforce our explicit terms of service and the partnerships to, to strengthen the broader ecosystem. I want to talk about the responsibilities in the context potentially of the Christchurch call. And, and the reason that is, is why Microsoft really was a strong supporter of this multi-stakeholder approach. Sherry articulated, we're talking about something that is a whole of society challenge or problem. If we are going to meaningfully address that, then we need to understand how we are gonna collaborate across the multiple sectors who have a perspective, intelligence, expertise, and different roles and responsibilities. The Christchurch call is unique, I believe, in articulating the defined roles and responsibilities of governments, of industry, and then what we should collaboratively do together. I'll just articulate a few. In the government space, it is clear to counter all notions of what breeds terrorism and violent extremism from lack of economic opportunity, and it articulates that. On industry, it's about being explicit in what our terms of service are, how we do our enforcement, and how we're transparent. And then collaboratively, how we start sharing knowledge to, to, to tackle some of the more challenging areas. I want to to, uh, uh, state what I think becomes problematic. If we think about a, a, a framework that we're looking at right now, I'll call it the patchwork quilt of laws that is happening globally in this area. We need to start having a conversation about what is the true risk and what is the ap appropriate responses. We need to be thinking about what is different in a social media platform that might be shared from one to many. And by the way, I'm not talking about Facebook here. I'm talking about our own social media platform, LinkedIn. That is different than a sharing from a one to a few or a one to one. It is wholly different than an enterprise infrastructure in which we're creating an, a suite of office products so that the next retail or manufacturer has access to technology and tools to provide economic opportunity. We don't have control over content in that area. And then you talk about the cloud infrastructure. I'll tell you the challenge in this legal and regulatory framework is when some people approach this and say, let's just sweep in everything called a technology solution or an electronic service provider and, and do not have a conversation about what is the risk we're trying to address. We want to address the risk and the way to do that is if you make sure that we're clear on those responsibilities. So I hope we can have a little conversation about what happens when that gets hazy and the challenge that has probably bridges right next into the next conversation. And that is uh, our fundamental goal, is when we take these actions that we are committed to upholding human rights. And we need to be transparent about doing that, and I think that's a further conversation we're having today. Great, thank you. I think that will be a nice segue into the rights one. We've got one more speaker first, uh, Civil Society, uh, Yuda Witrade, the Watchdog app inviter. I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. Don't worry, everybody gets it wrong on the first try. So hi, my name is Idan Javijaratna. I wear, I'm from Sri Lanka. I wear two hats. One is as, and I've been told I speak a little bit too fast, so I'm going to slow myself down. Um, one is as a data scientist at a think tank called LearnAsia. We've been operating in the global south for the last 15 years. The other is as the co-founder of a fact checker called Watchdog, which was founded in the wake of the recent terror attacks in Sri Lanka. So let me sort of, can I ask for a raise of hands? How many of you have seen a bomb go off? Yeah? There you are. And because, well, there. So not a lot in the room, and I think those in the room 
will understand what I'm talking about when I say it's hell. It's this numbness that happens. It's, it's not even panic. It's just what, what, right? It's this utter sort of blankness that hits you. So when the bombs went off, now previously I had been, since March 2018, I had been working in some instances so slightly antagonistically with Facebook, in some instances afterwards with Facebook crisis response actually, on the analysis of large scale language data sets to better understand hate speech. When the bombs went off, a friend of mine who was right there, he had been going to a hotel to meet his business partner, and he had been two or three minutes late, and the man lives on Instagram, so he'd been Instagramming it live, bodies are flying off. Uh, call, you know, called me and said, this, we need to do something. Um, and we met, and we realized that, you know what, by the time these conversations happen, these conversations need to happen. We need to think rigorously, and with, I would say, with academic rigor, particularly when we come to the moderation of content in an automated manner. But by the time these conversations happen, it's often too late. People are dying. And this is not something we can sort of tiptoe around at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And there are various mechanisms in government, for example, we discussed whether it would be feasible to wait until the ICCPR Act 56 had kicked in and reports were coming in of hate speech, these things were being processed by a court of law, and often, no, not really, it's, it's far too late. So there is a, what we saw was a need for an almost first responder style of civic tech that could fight fire with fire in that particular instance. So in 36 hours, we created what we call Watchdog, which verifies information with journalists on the ground in the particular areas in which info fake news is reported. Um, we launched with 45,000 users. Colombo is a very small city, so that was actually quite a lot of people there. And we've been running since, and at a point we realized that we have become the largest misinformation data set in Sri Lanka. And at another point, I almost had a panic moment where I realized, well, now we have 100 people working for us, and we're really running this weirdly tiny thing that grew to be a monster. Um, and this feeds in into what I had been working on as a data scientist at LearnAsia, where we you know, try to do this with academic rigor and bring that perspective to policy. I actually consider us a failure. When I say we had 45,000 users on launch, people go, wow, that's amazing. I consider us a failure because at the scale and velocity of hate speech being produced in Sri Lanka right now, for example, you mentioned that Germany has a minority of users who are actually indulging in hate speech. I would say in Sri Lanka it's a majority. So at the scale and velocity that content is being produced online, humans aren't up for the task anymore unless Facebook hires 50% of its user base to police the other 50%, this is just not practically possible. Then we had, we had started engaging with Facebook and trying to understand why Facebook in particular, because you have this you know, level of policy that we, we're not seeing necessarily from other platforms, why these policies are not being enforced in countries like Sri Lanka. You know, they may be enforced in countries like Germany and in instances in the US, but in countries like ours, particularly in the Global South, because you're part of a network of Global South think tanks, the enforcement is absolutely horrible. So I realize I'm a bit like Brutus here. I come to Berry's season not to praise him. Um, and we realize the technical challenges of implementing something like the Christchurch call, which is that a lot of languages in the Global South are what we call resource poor languages in linguistics. The fundamental corpuses aren't there, corpora rather, the tokenizers aren't there, the lemmatizers aren't there. What this boils down to in a non-tech perspective is what someone can do, what, you know, what a tech guy can read a piece of policy, what they can do in a few lines of code in Python, in English or in German, or in Dutch or Afrikaans, the West Germanic language tree, which is very well documented, very well researched. What they can do in a few lines of Python code is about 10 years away in Sinhala or Tamil. And then we also realize that there is a design problem in some cases, in algorithms. Now, consider, to give a little bit more context, the majority of hate speech happening right now in Sri Lanka is anti-Muslim, is anti-Tamil. So we spoke with 
uh, quite a few Facebook engineers actually, and they pointed out that specificity of a threat is something that they look for in trying to implement these policies. So hypothetically something like, I will kill my this neighbor at 8 a.m. tomorrow is a specific threat that gets flagged on multiple levels and it's, it's flagged as a high priority threat. Now Singhala, my native language, doesn't have a future tense. Right, so this doesn't work. So there needs to be, in my opinion, rigorous research done into these languages, into the shape and dynamics of how hate speech manifests. And it's not enough anymore to analyze a few comments, to sit back and write wonderful policy, but there needs to be better collaboration with the tech community because Facebook potentially is the largest repository of text content online today. That data needs to be brought to civil society in the countries that these problems appear and to academics in the countries that these problems appear, to linguists, to people who understand the etymology of these terms that appear. And I'll give you one example. The word thambi in Tamil means younger brother. Um, now this between two Tamil speakers is a sign of endearment. Singhala, the sort of Singhala nationalist racist lobby has a appropriated this to be an insult. So from a Singhala man to a Muslim man, it is an insult roughly on par with the N-word. So now you have to understand that there is Tamil content manifesting in a Singhala, uh, in a piece of Singhala text. And, to, and for an algorithm to understand that this is hate speech, it must understand the ethnicities of the two people involved in the conversation, which is a, which is a huge problem, which is a violation. So there are certain classes of problems that because of language structures, because of the nature of hate speech itself, cannot actually be trusted to automated analysis without violating human rights. Then we have to go one level deeper and understand that this, this word Thambi mm. might, you know, used by a Singhala racist would potentially be written in English script representing Singhala. So now we are talking three layers of language nested in one. So it's not that simple to imagine that any company can press a big red button and wipe this stuff offline. That's one. But what I'd like also like to see is those companies engaging with people on the ground, with, again, with academics on the ground, because the research capacity is there, the expertise is there, but the data sets are elsewhere, the designers are com elsewhere. Um, you know, I really do not fancy someone in Menlo Park who is familiar with English and the subject object verb order therein, designing something that is meant to work in other languages where the verb order is completely different. It's, it's just a, it's, it's an utter design flaw. So there needs to be, in my opinion, much tighter collaboration. And this comes also down to mind share. This also comes down to funding because the Christchurch call is a fantastic, it's an absolutely fantastic piece of policy. Mm. But it took New Zealand stepping up to get the world's attention on that. Bombs go off in a lot of other countries. People die in a lot of other countries. Mm. They're often not paid attention to. They're often not discussed. So I'm very, very thankful actually for New Zealand for stepping up and elevating these problems to global discourse to a level where you can have this conversation. In my opinion, before we get to, you know, wonderful discussions on policy that potentially change how governments work, we actually need to address the tech problems and lawmakers need to take the efforts to engage with, machine, with the machine learning communities, with data scientists, to understand what is practically possible and what needs to be done to make certain things which are impossible today practically possible. Otherwise, all of this is just nice pieces of paper. Thank you very much, Yuda. That was an absolutely fascinating perspective. And the whole set of government, company, and, and that last piece on the, the science behind a lot of these challenges shows both the, the breadth of the challenge that we face in dealing with this content and the fact that none of us has the tools to tackle it by ourselves and that we need this cross-cutting dialogue to turn into cross-cutting action, which is what the Christchurch call called for. Um, Look, that was our responsibilities and responses section. And before we get into the audience um, uh, ideas and questions and comments, we're going to go straight into the rights and risks side, which I think you've seen some of already floating up in the dialogue that we've had. 
And we're going to start that off with Edison Lanza um, to sort of set the scene, if you like. And then I'll be inviting the panelists to briefly respond. You don't all have to respond. You all can respond. The more of you who want to respond, the quicker your responses will be. And then we'll get straight into um, audience considerations. So all, all yours. Okay, hello, everyone. And finally, last but not least, freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I want to say that hate speech and inside violence and, and terrorism is one of the most controversial areas of content moderation and freedom of expression now around the world. Given the, the, the difficulty of defining the, the category and the importance of the game, and, and try to address uh, very quickly uh, two uh, phenomena or two impacts that this, uh, you know, problem having the ecosystem of freedom of expression. Uh, in one side, the, the response of the states and the risk the, in, in uh, link with the response of the, the, the states, and, and in the other side, the, the tech companies. Um, First of all, in my capacity of uh, uh, reporter of freedom of expression, I have deployed the, the systematic or targeted uh, attacks on democracy and freedom of expression by states and not state actors in many countries uh, which take place in different contexts, including international and non-international armed conflict, terrorist attacks, uh, the widespread or, uh, of the organized crime, uh, in particular in my region, in Latin America, that. Uh, Perhaps terrorism is not the, the, the you know the, the huge problem, but uh, the, the you know the, the insight of violence uh, regards the crime, crime and or organizations uh, around the Latin America. Um, also, I have drawn attention on the, the need to address the serious problems that arise in the context of digital technologies, uh, including misinformation, disinformation, terrorism, recruit and propaganda. Uh, arbitrary and uh, unlawful surveillance, uh, interference with uh, the use of encryption and anonymity technologies in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the arena of uh, journalism on, or human rights defenders. Um, it's important then to, to address that the state often respond uh, uh, this, uh, at this situation in a rapid, reactive manner and imposing in, injustifiable or, dis, or disproportional uh, restriction on, on freedom of expression, like censorship and uh, the overbroad criminalization of expression. Uh, this is not a, an effective response to extremists. Uh, an open and critical debate is an important part of any strategy to address systematic attack of freedom of expression. Uh, without debate and counter speech, we call uh, underlying causes and can drive grievance and underground and foster violence. In particular, the state should refrain from applying restriction relating to terrorism in a broad manner. Because uh, we are here all democracies with rule of law, but in many countries in my region, like Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Another one, also democracies that now and, and, uh, are, are under pressure, uh, like Bolivia, Chile. Um, the use of this concept in bad form, like glorify, justify, uh, encouraging terrorists, should be, you know, uh, a push for more criminalization or, uh, under uh, or on. Uh, the, the legal uh, speech or the, 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 the speech that is protected under international law. Uh, in the other side, filtering uh, of the content of internet and uh, using uh, kill switches uh, uh, or takeovers um, also it's a, uh, it's a problematic measure which can never be justified under international law. In the, order, in the other hand, we have the right of the journalists to protect the identity of, of the and the confidentiality of the sources of information against the you know the direct and indirect exposure, including uh, surveillance and, and, and the, the judiciary. You know, um, the other actor the, uh, in relation with the, the companies that the, the platform that have a, a 
a big role, a huge role, a huge role in a huge role in, in the moderation of the content uh, and the flow of information. Um, the special report is of freedom of expression uh, of the, of the all the, around the world. We have done in recent years concrete recommendations to the companies to seek in, uh, and implement human rights standards in, the, in, in their policies, in the policies of content of moderation. Um, and I, I, I want to refer finally a, a set of uh, recommendations uh, to the company. Um, first of all, I, we think that the uh, back up of, by the state regulation of the oversight of the civil society, the companies must mitigate the human rights harms and ongoing human rights impact uh, assessment to their policies. Uh, what kind of measure that we recommended? First of all, conducting periodic human rights due diligence assessment and review uh, over uh, their policies and the effect, of human, uh, effect on human rights. Uh, Aligning hate speech policies to meet the requirement of legality, uh, necessary and proportionally, that the, the, the test that the, the international law that now uh, you know recommend in, in, in different uh, areas. Uh, third, improving the process for the, 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 the remedies in cases where people's rights are infringed, especially created a transparent and an accessible mechanism for appealing the platform de uh, decisions. Uh, I think that, and, and, and I, uh, very pleasure to, to hear that Facebook is coming and moving, moving on to, you know, to building this kind of independent oversight. Uh, taking account the need for measures to combat incitement of violence, discourse, uh, the companies will be considered more graduate response according to the, you know, the context uh, of the, each country. Uh, I think that uh, the, the, the case of Sri Lanka shows that the, if Facebook or Twitter or Google, Microsoft have, uh, you know, a, a global uh, approach, also need to engage, more engage with the particularity of the local context in each country. It's not the similar cases, for example, in Mexico than Argentina or Chile or Canadian in the Western Hemisphere. And in, in, in different cases, we, we know that the Facebook's response or Twitter, so on, response, the, the response is, uh, you know, so slow because uh, uh, before that, don't have a you know a, a you know, like a, a science policy or s somebody to alert the, the increase of the the, 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 the incitement or the discourse that incite uh, violence. Um, and finally, uh, we note that uh, it's necessary to adopt in the international standards in the content moderation policies, uh, and that I think that can give to the companies a framework for making, you know, a better approach and, and also a better response to the, to the states. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alison. That's a nice um, sort of set of ideas to nudge this discussion around um, rights and risks on. And I invite panelists, if you've got a, a few thoughts on that topic, the, both the discussion that you shared previously and, and this starter. Um, what are the rights, uh, you know, that are at risk, if you like, or the risks created to human rights posed by um, terrorist and violent extremist content regulation approaches? Um, and how do the risks get addressed in whatever it is that we need to do? So who's got a, Sherry, go ahead. So we understand that other governments, uh, based on legitimate concerns, have taken different approaches to internet governance, such as regulations. Um, and you know, the argument is, of course, that having more restrictive laws in place would help us address the problem better. However, um, in our view, we're not sure that more restrictive laws would do anything but constrain innovation and uh, commerce and make the Internet actually less open. Um, we think that governments regulating removal of more or all vaguely defined terrorist content, and that can mean many different things to many governments, faster, including within a specific time frame, can actually focus too heavily on the technological tools rather than on the bad actors who are abusing them. And in addition, passing regulations to put the onus 
for content moderation on companies alone is likely to cause an over uh, removal of content and the building of things like upload filters, which will in fact possibly constrain human rights such as freedom of expression. Our experience is that, and we continue to contend, that voluntary collaboration with the technology companies and all stakeholders on this issue is a better approach. We think that the companies know better the um, content on their platforms, how to uh, identify and remove content more quickly and to keep it from propagating. And we continue to argue that some of the regulations we're seeing and potentially conflicting, someone's already mentioned this, but it's very important, potentially conflicting regulations as we're all doing this, or not all, many governments are doing this, can in fact <clears throat> be an inspiration for more repressive regimes to fine or imprison uh, company executives, for example, for not removing, quote, extremist content that may actually be political dissent. And in fact, I would just point to a recent foreign policy article which contends that, uh, for example, the, the German Network Enforcement Act may be being used by uh, dictators around the world as a sort of model of uh, censorship. And Finally, I just want to stress that we want to be sure that our responses to this threat are not endangering the guiding principles we all hold in an open, interoperable, secure, and reliable internet. Our responses to this threat should not um, actually put at risk the, the positives, as someone mentioned already, the things that we are trying to uphold. Thanks. Who else? Yeah, Dr. Park. There is a, another law um, from uh, Australia uh, that uh, imposes uh, liability on the platforms for not removing, uh, quote, abhorrent violent content, uh, which is itself uh, vaguely defined. But the bigger problem is that uh, it uh, obligates the platforms to engage in general monitoring, which should be, which is already uh, banned, was supposed to be banned under the uh, e-commerce, uh, e European Union's e-commerce e directive. Um, and it uh, incentivizes platforms to uh, install upload filters or any other form of uh, prior censorship. So the Australian law actually goes deeper than the Network Enforcement Act. Uh, but I want to say something on that to Enforcement Act as well. Um, now, intermediate liability safe harbor is already part of international human rights standard, according to the uh, UN Special Rapporteur's report uh, uh, on uh, freedom of uh, expression. Now, uh, the idea is that if you hold platforms liable for the content that they don't know about, then they'll engage in general monitoring and prior censorship. That's, that, that's the theory. Uh, now, Network Enforcement Act only concerns the contents that the platforms are notified of. So on surface, it does not seem to touch upon, it does not seem to erode from uh, 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 international standard or intermediate liability or even the Manila principles of uh, uh, intermediate liability. But in effect, what ends up happening is that the platforms have to take chance, end up taking chance, when they're pressured to remove the notified illegal content in a very short amount of time, uh, when it takes time to really decipher the message and really decide whether it's illegal or not, they take chance on the side of uh, deleting instead of uh, maintaining the uh, content. We know that because uh, Korea has such law. We have a mandatory takedown law for illegal content. But in fact, a lot of lawful content are taken down when there was a, a big consumer disaster with a, a, a humidifier detergent, uh, somebody had this crazy idea that uh, evaporate, evaporating the, uh, or vaporizing the humidifier detergent itself will clean up the air, and a lot of uh, uh, babies and pregnant mothers who are depending on humidifiers ended up dying. Now, some people had early symptoms, try to put those uh, warnings online, but they are all taken down by platforms uh, because they uh, because they were given notices by 
humidifier detergent companies that mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it is defamatory, it is illegal, so they took the chance on the side of deleting them. Uh, that's one example of how uh, the restrictive law can really uh, 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 you know, shrink the civic space that can uh, protect our safety. Uh, I'll say something more about counter speech. Uh, counter speech uses the same language sometimes, or, or often the same language used by violent speech. Uh, we, uh, Open Net Korea, are representing a, uh, a feminist platform that uses mirroring uh, strategy, uh, basically using the same violent language against uh, uh, males just to let them feel how uh, let them feel, feel themselves how women are treated in the language space. Uh, and the, because they are using the same language, it comes into, uh, uh, it, it, it comes into uh, legal trouble, but only the postings, not the operator, right? The operator takes down all the contents that she has received the notices of, but still, the uh, government is going after network operator, which is suppressing counter speech uh, against uh, counter speech against uh, uh, male dominated uh, uh, language uh, space. Thank you for those two interesting examples. I've just got time for three or four, so you're going to have to be really quick. Um, one, two, three, four. So, yeah. I think there is a global consensus uh, that we have uh, uh, to delete child pornography. It's overall cultures. In other aspects, there is no global uh, uh, commitment. For, uh, I mentioned uh, that it, it's forbidden in Germany to deny Holocaust. In a country like Denmark, it's allowed. So we have uh, national rules um, made by national parliaments. And that is our, let's say, that's our line. And as, as I start, we don't speak about hate speech. We speak about hate crime. If freedom of expression Become, is, has a conflict with, the, with our cr criminal law. The companies are, at, are now uh, forced to delete it. That's the current regulation in Europe. Notice and take down. And they are still obliged to, to, to analyze what is legal or, or, or what isn't legal. Uh, the experience with the uh, network enforcement law shows that, uh, for example, a, a company like, like uh, uh, Twitter or uh, or Google get um, about 500,000 complaints a year uh, cons where, where users were concerned that something has, that has to do with hate speech or hate crime. And the delete rate is about 20-25%. That means that the companies uh, don't delete everything that the users are uh, sent to them. They, they are tr trying to do a good job in finding out what is illegal and what has to be removed and what uh, has to be uh, tolerated as part of freedom of speech. So um, there is no kind of, uh, of um, uh, as far as, as we see now, uh, that uh, there is uh, re removed, uh, uh, there are re removed too many things. Um, one effect of the public pressure in Germany, and that was not only the, the pressure from the government, it was the pressure from the civil society, it was the pressure of victims, was that companies like, uh, like Facebook had increased the, people, the number of people who are working in Germany dealing with that kind of job. And I think it's good. It, it's a good result. Um, and we see one effect. Uh, deleting posts, but also deleting accounts of very extremist groups and people mean that these groups have to leave Facebook, Twitter, and Google. Uh, they are looking now for other platforms, but they, are, they cannot convince all their followers to leave Facebook, Twitter, and Google. So it has a kind of, of positive effect in, in, in having less, uh, less propaganda or, or, or less... Um, Violating, uh, violating German laws. Thank you. Um, Courtney. Just to throw a couple more complications. I think we've uh, had, a, had a good conversation on the, the challenge with right of freedom of expression. I, I want to articulate, I think, why I started with the principles of the Christchurch call were so important is the, I'll call it, narrowly defined scope of terrorism and violent extremism. 
we're having a, a robust conversation moving into hate speech, which was, is not how, how we structured in, in that context. We've talked about the right of freedom of expression. I do not think we should forget the right to access information when we're thinking about the context of search engines. I don't think we should forget the right to privacy when we talk about over-application of some of these regulations outside, I'll call it public fora. Um, those are clearly tensions. But a couple points, um, we were talking about the conflict of laws and the challenge, and I think there's a couple trends that are, are concerning right now. Uh, even in the notice and takedown structure, we're starting to see conflict of laws when we see government orders coming in with extraterritorial application. Uh, yes, you may have defined that as illegal content within your geopolitical borders. That does not mean you get to do a global order for that content area. Um, I think we're going to see legal challenges uh, continue and multiply in that context. Uh, uh, another way that governments are looking at this is they'll talk about it as mere content. We think it's the same. It's got the same le language. You've articulated very well today. Context matters. Uh, it is, I I I'm sorry, I come from the government background, I don't know how you would narrowly define a mere content regulation right now because uh, we have to acknowledge that context matters. So we're seeing a trend in a, in a challenge and as this plays out from a conflict of laws perspective, we really do need some more robust conversation about how we are going to address narrowly defined harms that we acknowledge uh, in a way that does uphold the global framework of human rights. But I think I wanted to articulate those two narrow areas of, of places to be monitoring. Thank you, Courtney. We've got to Paul and then you did, and then we're, we're done. We're going to go to the audience. Um, thank you. I want to start with, this is hard. <laughs> okay? It's actually really hard. Um, but it's not so hard that we can't act. And actually not acting, I think, is one of the major risks um, that we, we face. Um, if I go back to the, you know, we've articulated risks to freedom of expression, we've articulated a range of other risks. I go back to the Prime Minister's words after what happened in Christchurch. No one has the right to live stream themselves murdering 51 people. And there are a really large number of rights that are violated when that happens. I have spoken with people in fact, I've spoken with my own daughter, whose colleague was one of those 51 people. And I've watched what happens when that video flashes up on her live screen. We have, we have to put the victims at the centre of this and think really carefully about how we solve it. But we should not be hasty. We should not overreach. And that's why I think robust conversation and a holistic approach sits at the core of what we do. And unless we do have that robust conversation and we work this problem through carefully and in as measured a way as possible, the bigger risk, certainly from where we sit in New Zealand at the moment, and when we look at the impact this has had on New Zealanders' perceptions of the internet and the way they think about the benefits of the internet, the bigger risk, the bigger risk is to the internet as a whole and to the idea that toxicity might actually drive um, down use of the internet for the good things that we need to use it for. Thanks, Paul. Um, Muda. Right, so one concern I have on the rights perspective is that there seems to be a framing of bad actors in particular. That the, the, the sort of implicit idea that hate speech is innately spread by bad actors and bad actors alone, and misinformation is spread by bad actors and bad actors alone. So from the watchdog data set, let me tell you, they're not. The majority of hate speech and misinformation that we see, and often the two are so intertwined that you can't really tell the difference. The majority of us we see are from panicked and terrified mums on family WhatsApp groups saying, I heard this, are you safe? Or from office groups saying, why, haven't, why hasn't this guy uh, come to office today? Right? And they far outnumber the actual number of bad actors in play. So if you Creating, when we create policy, it is often important to acknowledge that there is a certain level of now surveillance almost being brought into play and that we cannot put those other users at risk. In the hunt for bad actors, in this, this sort of almost military search to take these things down, we, can't, we need to acknowledge that there are actual people, there are perfectly normal people at risk here. And the second is on bias because I've, I've sort of, I hope I've hit home on the importance of having automated content monitoring. Now, it is almost mathematically impossible to engineer a system without bias. If you take two groups, you can optimize for 
parity between classes, so you can optimize for various things, but you will always have false positives and false negatives. In a machine system, in a human system, in a human plus machine system, whether it's animal, vegetable, or mineral, this happens. Right? So outliers always happen. And that's really where a lot of focus needs to go into. We can have systems that effectively deal with 80% of scenarios, but as you spoke of mirroring, those are outlier conditions. How do we deal with that? This is where we bring humans into the loop, and it's very important to think of that before we launch these systems. Which sort of brings me to my third point. I hope at some point that when we do get around to doing these things, the, the fundamental data sets, the protocols observed in the design of these systems can be made open for critique by civil society, because particularly when I look around at IGF, this is a multi-stakeholder forum, and I'm 100% sure that right now, if you take these people alone, There'll be someone who can come at the data set, who can analyze the data set and say, this particular race is overrepresented or underrepresented. There will probably be someone who can come at it from a rights perspective and say, these classes of data should not be included in this data set. There's someone who can come at it from a legal perspective and say, this is not compliant with X policy or Y that is nationally acknowledged, it is, and it is important policy. And it is critically important that when these solutions are launched, I don't trust anyone who comes and says, oh, we have AI to solve this. I generally tend to call bull on those. It's critically important that we have this multidisciplinary interrogation of solutions before they launch, particularly if they are public-facing solutions. Thank you. Thank you for that exchange, panelists. So now I'm going to open it up to the audience to see what we get. Um, uh, and I'll just do kind of a sweep. Um, then we're going to close with a very brief interventions, and if, what that means is that if we run out of time, we'll just stop where we are, about the two closing questions. So I'm just going to remind you of those. What are your policy recommendations going forward in this area, and what role can the IGF ecosystem play? But in the meantime, if you'd like to come up to the mics, um, or those, we'll start at the front table, so I'm just going to go there. Um, really brief, please. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the uh, wonderful uh, topic. Uh, this is uh, Garanay from Afghanistan. I am working with the president's office. Uh, uh, I will call this uh, session, as, uh, from my point of view, uh, ICT for Peace, Information and Communication Technology for Peace. Mm -hmm. So, as you know that Afghanistan is uh, under pressure and terrorist attacks and things like that, so as a student of technology, uh, what is the, the contribution of uh, policy that uh, Facebook uh, made it? Uh, what is the contribution of that policy in context of Afghanistan? Thank you so much. Sure. Well, our, our policies are, are global, and they, they certainly a, apply uh, in an Afghan context. Um, it, additionally, the, the Taliban are on the UN's consolidated sanctions list, um, which means that content produced by the Taliban can be shared in the GIFCT's hash sharing database. Um, but let me pose a hard question. Um, it, we certainly remove content produced by the Taliban and in, in support of the Taliban. Um, but how do we deal with content when the Taliban are engaged in a peace process um, and they're engaged in negotiations with the Afghan government, with other governments in the world? Um, that is a very difficult thing for a platform that is trying to set sort of objective standards around uh, an organization and specific types of content uh, to manage. Um, and it's easy to say, well, perhaps the platform should work with the governments involved to figure out what's right there. But that opens the door to all sorts of other abuses. So I think this is it. it um, we certainly um, uh, are attuned to this. They, but there are, other, there are other points we could go to. Some of the minor, the smaller languages in Afghanistan, we run into some of the same problems that were described in Sri Lanka where some of our classifiers don't, don't work as well because we don't have as much training data. So I think it's um, every country in the world has a lot of these complexities in a lot of different ways, uh, and Afghan, Afghanistan is certainly, is certainly one of them. 
going to take the next question from the microphone in the first. So if, you want to, if you're not sitting at the front table, you want to speak, get behind the microphone so I can see you there. Don't put your hand up in the audience. Yes, you. I'm Rajesh Charya from India, speaking in my personal capacity. Terrorism doesn't have any language, religion, or country. It is affecting all. If you see all the people who are sitting on the dais is now affected by the terrorism in any way. And we are very much concerned about that. Why not the international policies are being made in the terrorism so that if any country is getting affected, the real-time data removal or real-time source known to the law enforcement agency will help. Otherwise, what happened? The organization or the companies take the shelter of their respective country's law and they don't respond to the countries from where the terrorism request is coming. And this delay caused badly damage to that respective country because I am from the country which is badly hit by the terrorism and I am very much concerned about that. Yeah, we'll have a response from you then. Yeah, um, let me counter with a case study from Sri Lanka. When the bombs went off, the government, well, there was radio silence from the government for six hours. Then one minister came online and said, oh yes, my father hangs out with intelligence types. He said something was happening and that's why I didn't go to church. Then the president came and said, uh, I knew nothing about this. I just saw it on social media. Then the terrorist investigatory department came and said, um, hang on, we've been telling you about these guys for the last three years. There are instances where official government sources are not always either competent or acting in the best interests of people. And there are always instances where due process and due diligence needs to be followed over real-time over real time pro protocols of action. There are plenty of instances where knee-jerk reactions will actually do more harm and encourage surveillance statism as opposed to a free and democratic society where these things are actually critiqued better. I Thank note Keith, that there is a technological challenge in this underdeveloped or developing country, but we cannot escape with the freedom of expression or the privacy. Where the issue of national security is coming, we have to, we have to compromise with the freedom of expression and privacy. I suspect we, this will be a very long philosophical yeah. argument, so maybe we should move on to other yeah. questions. Well, we'll have to, to move on. It's a deeply unsatisfying format, I don't know, but we'll get as many exchanges as we can. Gentlemen, sitting down on the table, this one with the microphone. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Khalid Fatal. I'm the chairman of the MLI Group. Um, some of what I'm going to share with you may be uniquely relevant to the topics you talked about because we bring in some certain expertise in that space. MLI stands for Multilingual Internet, so many of you have heard of the term Multilingual Internet. I and a few, a handful of people championed this back since the 90s. In the last 10 years, we've been uniquely focused on mitigating cyber terrorism and the motivation behind some of these um, groups. And um, for Brian, who is a lecturer of, uh, in uh, terrorism or anti-terrorism, of course, <laughs> um, you might find this is even more compelling because we created a label to identify these threats back in 2012. We call them polycyber and geopolycyber. And why this is relevant is because in the context of dealing with this topic today at IGF, which is the online content in terrorism, it's only a portion of the big threat landscape. And, um, I really wasn't going to speak at this panel, but I felt myself compelled because there is no such a thing as a global policy that will serve to make the internet this, uh, this, this uh, platform for, for good. Uh, and that's not enough. So permit me to make, you, to make some of you uncomfortable uh, uh, constructively. If I was to ask you, instead of sitting on these chairs and holding the microphones to do your panel speeches, to sit on the floor, no microphones, and to have to scream to everybody to hear you, uh, you'll feel uncomfortable. Unfortunately, doing what is necessary is going to require companies to do what is uncomfortable to their business models. Two days after the Christchurch attacks, I put out a call for social media platforms to stop, to block live streaming. 
Yes, it was not meant to be, it's not going to be beneficial to everybody who used it for good purposes. But we saw this as a future trend. And I think the gentleman from New Zealand, Paul, um, uh, you highlighted this exceptionally well. And I think this is, this is part of the challenge that we face. So the Christchurch call is superb. I believe the, your prime minister has been uh, uh, exceptionally sincere. But unfortunately, we're only always finding ourselves reacting to events, not proactively uh, acting. So this space at IGF is only a talk shop. This is conversation. What may not necessarily end up happening is what is necessary. And there's no way we can create a global policy while the rule of what is accepted as legal in the United States, and I speak as a US citizen, is going to be the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the format that will guide these principles. Because let's be, let's be clear, Christchurch had one tragedy, and they took action and they legislated. I was in Los Angeles at the time when a youngster went into a high school and shot people. Last but not least, the gentleman from Germany, uh, you are right, uh, the terrorists do have an agenda, but I think the biggest challenge we face is understanding accurately the motivation as to why these terrorists become what they are. And needing, uh, figuring out how to deal with this will help us not only take down some of the content, but mitigate the threats. Last but not least, let's keep, let's keep uh, uh, ourselves in, you know, reminded that the Cambridge Analytica had a far detrimental role in hijacking and putting democracy under unprecedented threat than terrorists who think they can change the way we do things in the West. So I, I think this is a food for thought that what we are trying to do may not necessarily be achievable as a global uh, uh, model, but may end up being compelled to becoming a local legislation by which networks have to obey the law. And let's be, let's be clear as well. Uh, when the, uh, the uh, uh, Dow Chemical was caught or found uh, uh, responsible for the uh, Bhopal uh, chemical plant attack, uh, yeah, chemical that's getting plant, a little bit off topic. For this. I pre I, I, it's not off topic, and I'll tell you why. Because if, it, if a social media platform continues to treat itself as a technical platform, not a publisher, it mitigates the responsibility of the content on it. Therefore, the legal responsibility. Um, the laws so far don't look like they're gonna change unless we start figuring out how to actually compel organizations to do what is necessary to serve the global public good. I think we're gonna have a bigger challenge than we're facing. My two uh, cents. Th yeah, thanks for your five cents. Um, I'm not gonna ask anyone to respond to that one. We'll go on to the next question, standing up at the mic. Hi, um, I think there's a bias in terrorism research and it's existed for decades. We haven't really learned the lessons of Latin America. We haven't really learned the lessons of the global war on terror that started with 9-11. Now, yeah, it's quite a platitude. But well, firstly, uh, the history of, of terrorist attacks and, 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 and terrorist victims are primarily a result of state terror. So there's almost no discussion on the panel about state terror. And um, yeah. secondly, uh, you call someone a terrorist and then uh, the point two ones before me was, was very relevant, but one day you're gonna have to negotiate with the people that you call terrorists. For example, uh, the Taliban, um, and for example, uh, the government of my country, the African National Congress, they used to be classified as a terrorist organization. And yeah, we had negotiations and a transition. So, um, yeah, we, there's a huge bias in the debate. And if we don't learn from the, the lessons of counterterrorism in history, we're bound to repeat them. And secondly, uh, those of us who would like to understand terrorism and research terrorism, if the content is taken offline, uh, where, where is that for the historical record for researchers and academics other than with Facebook, Twitter, and the major platforms. Thank you. Thank you. Um, brief response. 
So I think, uh, just just briefly, I won't respond to, to all of that, but I wanted to, to, to respond to the last point because I think it's an important one that the platforms are thinking about. I, you know, as a former academic, you know, I, I thanked the Internet Archive in my uh, the notes to my book um, because of the amount of research material I was able to pull from there. Um, and so I think that there is a, uh, meaning raw terrorist material. So I think it, it's a point well taken, and I think this is a place where there is an opportunity for real collaboration, and, and the IGF is a great forum for that, to discuss how when... Um, when platforms like ours are removing this content that violates our terms of service, um, and I think we are right to do so, but how do we preserve that material in a way so it is accessible to researchers, to human rights investigators, and folks like that? That is a conversation that needs to include activists, it include, needs to include companies, and it needs to include governments to make sure that we have space to preserve that material given existent privacy laws, et cetera. So um, I, I just want to thank you for, for pointing that out, and I think it is a place where there's likely a lot of agreement, um, but a need for real cooperation across different sectors. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Um, I've only got time for two more interventions. So the gentleman with his hand up at, on the table had done, indicated a number of times, so you go first, and then the man standing there, and then we're done, I'm afraid. Thank you. I'll keep it brief. Neil Kashwaha, representing private sector in Canada. I have a question uh, for the entire panel. I'm very impressed with the, uh, the group of you, scholars, uh, lawyers, government, and corporate representation. Do you believe nations have a position to claim due diligence under international law to nation states for their lack of action toward headquartered companies who do not or are unable to manage, contain, or limit uh, TVIC and hate speech or crime, thereby holding nations accountable. Thank you. Who, who would like to have a, a go at answering that question? Do, do, you, do any of you wanna? No, that's, that's a solid no in, in answering that question, which I think probably means it was one that's given people food for thought. Thank you. Um, the person standing, yes, thank you. My name's Mukam. I work at Afrinic Limited. So, I know this is the Internet Governance Forum, so there is the risk to think that all problems, even though the Internet's used to amplify them, can be solved here. Data code protocols might not be able to solve all of these problems. We do know that traditional news organizations, sometimes based in the countries where these uh, terrorist activities take place, might have a better understanding of the context. So I'd be curious to know how you see traditional news organizations playing their role in solving this, because the scale of the internet is a disadvantage it's a weakness in this context and other strength. So the distributed nature of news organizations and the fact that they're locally based gives them advantage. So I'd be curious to know how these people, um, the news organizations, can help solve this. Sherry, do you want to briefly and then you then? So I'm so glad you raised that uh, question or point, actually. It's a very good point. And I think that, um, you know, one of the problems we face in this very complex and difficult, as Paul said, issue is that it is, um, there's a risk because the internet is such a, um, you know, popular topic. It does tend to suck all the air out of the room uh, when it comes to other medium. And we know that, media, sorry. We do know that a lot of radicalization to violence, a lot of these activities continue to take place person to person without any technology involved, as well as um, through broadcast media, traditional broadcast media. There are, of course, places where the internet has not uh, penetrated, uh, sometimes mobile phone apps, sometimes not, but it's really very important, even when that is true, that the internet is available, that a lot of the sort of content we're talking about is also being produced and distributed through traditional media. And also I would point out on the positive side, that is an opportunity for us and that's something that we as U.S. government have tried to um, 
continue to use these this broadcast media um, popularity as a means for counter speech, as the companies call it. For us, it's countering violent extremism or counter me countering messages. So it is a very important part of the equation, and I think actually a reminder to all of us that this is much a much bigger issue than what is online. Definitely what is offline, as well as other media, are critically important. Thanks. Very good for you, Dad. And then, um, yeah, there was an. I can see where that question is coming from. Mm. Um, there was quite recently after the Sri Lankan bombings. There's an article in the the state blocked Facebook, and there was an article in the New York Times saying, "Good that Sri Lanka has blocked Facebook because it will end hate speech. It will, you know, this violence has gone too far." And my first reaction was, "Hang on, we've we've been putting all manner of remorseless pieces of metal into people's bodies for the last 30 years of civil war." And we did that without Facebook or without the internet. There are fundamental social problems that need to be solved, that there is reconciliation that need to be done in a lot of our societies, offline, where connectivity and these things are. But this is slightly out of the scope of what we can tackle one piece at a time. And we can tackle, you know, we can look at it in, a form, in the form of internet and we can say, okay, let's narrow that down to a platform view, let's narrow that down to a specific type of content and let's try and tackle that. When broader social issues need legislation and policy and thought elsewhere. Um, and I would say that, yes, a lot of our societies uh, are generally influenced by conversation that has certain implicit biases that usually come from the West. Uh, the gentleman from, South, from Africa spoke about uh, government and state-sponsored terror uh, and the fact that we don't acknowledge it. These are serious problems. Uh, there are certain implicit biases in fora like these where we assume that good policy in the hands of good lawmakers will solve all problems, but that's not necessarily true if you look at the history of our governments and of our societies. Uh, we have to take a little bit more of a game theoretic view and assume that not everyone is acting in everyone's best interests. Edison, you wanted to make a really quick one and then I'm gonna go to the closing. So. Yeah, no, uh, very quick. In, in the other hand, the, the, the role of the, the journalists and the press is very important. And it's very important also to protect, you know, the, um, the research of the press about terrorism and the possibility to speak, speak out in the media about that. There, is, there, are, there was a, a case in Canada that uh, a broadcasting network, the VICE, uh, uh, conducted an a investigation, a research with sources about uh, ISIS, and uh, a, a judge and the, the, you know, the court uh, complained that uh, they should be you know, disclosed uh, their sources. And this is a, a way to, you know, to uh, have a lack of information and debate about the phenomena of terrorism. And uh, the second point, very shortly, is that also the public authorities uh, use the narrative of terrorism and to attack a legitimate discourse in many countries. And, and also, you know, the, the, the public authorities have freedom of expression, but also have the duty to conduct the, the speech in a, in a you know, pr very precise and rigorous manner. For example, in, in, our, in our region, in Latin America, many, you know, presidents or uh, secretaries of state from different countries, for example, if, if, if in front or about a, a protest, they say, oh, this protest is a terrorist act. Oh, mm. this, this speech is a terrorist act. It's not it's mm. that. It's a protected speech. No? And, and finally, many of in, in the panel and in, in the public you know, refer to the, the, the legal framework of the country like uh, a, a, a patron or, or like, a, uh, like a scope that the, the platform should be adapted. And I say, well, the, uh, the legality is one of the, 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 you know, the condition of the test, but the international law have other two tests that uh, have relation with the necessary and the proportional of the measure. And not even all the, the laws complying with this, with this kind of, of test. And uh, perhaps, and I know that, many uh, you know, law about uh, hate and uh, terrorism, you know, uh, managing a, a broad uh, definition 
that uh, you know don't allow to to have a, a free speech and a flow of information in the countries. Thank you. Um, thank you for the questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time for more. We are all very time compressed now, so you have a 30 second slot to just make a closing comment or remark. Please do not turn that into two minutes each. We have to clear the room and so on. So just very briefly, we'll do the panel in order this way. So what would you like to, to close with? So the uh, policy proposal, um, I think uh, CDA 230 type of uh, safe harbor is t uh, goes too far. Uh, I think it, it gives a bad name for intermediate liability safe harbor because uh, it exempts platforms, platforms uh, f uh, from liability, even for the contents that they know to be illegal. Um, I think that something like the MCA 512, the, the copyright takedown, uh, notice any takedown system, uh, incentivize the platforms to take down a lot of content, but voluntarily. So uh, uh, from constitutional point of view, it, it is okay, and also they uh, they, uh, they, they respond to reinstatement request to bring back up the contents that are uh, uh, lawful in good faith from the uh, perspective of uh, authors. Now, another uh, yeah, pitfall. I don't think we have time of, for another, just, sorry. But yeah. just, uh, uh, just one more point. Well, another pitfall of a mandatory takedown type of regulation is that it entrenches uh, the current dominant platforms into the continuing dominance because uh, Facebook just said you have uh, 15,000 uh, uh, reviewers. Now the uh, platform that wants to compete with the Facebook will have to have the financial resources to hire that many people to be part of uh, something like uh, Gibbs City. So uh, that, that, that's another policy reason against uh, uh, mandatory uh, takedown okay. type of regulation. Great, thank you. Um, Along the panel, briefly, please. We should not only talk about um, online. We had to talk about real life. Uh, and uh, what I think uh, is very important to exchange best practice, to exchange research, how, what are the reasons that people become an extremist? And what could we do to avoid it? Or what uh, kind of repression is necessary on, 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 the, on the stage? And therefore, it should not only be in, in a discussion about social networks. I mean, they have an important role, and they had to understand what their digital responsibility means in the times. But we have to, had to widen the, uh, the discussion and to, uh, to learn from each other. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, really, the, the complicating issue and the corporate side, the, do we have to? Uh, keep the, our duty and the responsibility for the, this kind of very extreme the changing environment and the, we have to the, the react very the, the agilely in the, this kind of the changing the environment and for the corporate that we should the, we should give the very the clear law and the responsibility and the immunity, and the, for the most of the most important thing is that I think that the, for the digital and the media literacy is very important. The, for the we keep the, our the environment more healthy and the safety, it is our all of the, our keep in mind that. Okay. Thank you. Next. Echoing uh, the complication here, I, I do have to um, cite uh, a, a valuable resource out there right now. I think this this panel is emblematic of what uh, President Microsoft has articulated as the tools and weapons in the digital age. Uh, the tools that were generated to create opportunity, economic opportunity, a free flow of information can be weaponized. Uh, I subscribed earlier to the important role that I think IGF can play in a multi-stakeholder forum like this, it is why the Christchurch call remains important. If we're talking about a whole society problem, we need to articulate what we're trying to solve and be very clear about the responsibilities of each sector, government, civil society, and industry. Acknowledging that technology put tools out there that can be weaponized, we recognize our responsibility. But if we don't all play a role, then we are gonna see all of the harms we talked about, the actual implication in, in suppressing human rights, the fragmentation of a global structure that undermines the promise of what technology can bring from economic opportunity and information opportunity, and uh, uh, lastly, it would actually uh, implicate um, the, the fundamental 
public harms that we've talked about. Um, so continuing this conversation, I will say, needs to be free and, and, and transparent about what those conflict of law implications are for the broader perspective. Thank you. Next. Uh, just to reiterate, this is hard. And it's not just about the internet. It's about an holistic approach to dealing to harm and victims' rights. It's really easy for us to come to conferences and spend a lot of time talking about what we can't do. The Christchurch call was intended to set out some things we can, and that's the right thing to do. Um, the, the easy thing to do would have just been intemperate legislation or slagging off at the companies. We didn't. We want to do the right thing. Let's do it together. So I'm going to use the standard researcher's cop-out question. More research is required, but honestly, more research into languages, into the communities affected, into why these things actually manifest online and how they actually appear and the historical conditions in some cases that led them there. And the second is um, for governments to encourage first responder civic tech efforts and not just people who can write misinformation or fact-checker applications, but people who can actually discuss counter-narratives, actually get those things out there. Because there's always going to be this, speed, this delay in what mm. we're doing here and between people being affected, and that gap needs to be filled. Thanks. Quickly, I, I think that uh, two things. One is that sometimes ambiguity in law and in regulation leads to conservatism on the behalf of companies. Um, this is particularly true from my perspective in, the, in terms of data sharing to researchers and academics, potentially to other governments. Um, there are times when we would like to share information with researchers so that they can give us insights and we do not feel like we can or we risk severe penalties because of regulations like GDPR. Um, a lot of that may be not because GDPR actually prohibits it, but because no one's actually quite sure yet what GDPR actually means. So that's one point. The last point that I would make is about GIFCT more generally, and that um, as we come together in that effort, um, I think it's important. We've, we, we've come here today to describe GIFCT because we think IGF is an important place, and we, there are a lot of stakeholders here that are really important to that effort that we want to reach out to more. Um, we haven't done that over the past two years, but as we go forward with the new organization, uh, we hope very much that you'll be seeing more of us. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So I think that in addition to the challenges of defining terrorist content, and we could talk for days about that alone, um, I think one of the problem, one of the issues we need to address is an increasingly pressing question, and that is what does success look like in this space? Um, and we've already discussed a little bit about roles, about roles and responsibilities in addressing the problem. But I think that the questions are, are we really looking at an internet in which there is no objectionable or harmful content as deemed by various governments? Are we expecting users to be able to be educated enough to identify and address terrorist propaganda or other content online? Are companies responsible for removing anything that is harmful or objectionable? Um, I think that removing all content from the internet and the, uh, many of these objectives are actually um, not reconcilable with our belief in human rights and fundamental freedoms. So we really need to seek, I think, for a policy recommendation a very difficult but important balance between strong security, and I emphasize strong security, at the same time that we're respecting human rights um, and not having even a chilling effect on freedom of expression. And <clears throat> I think it's important that um, we remember that the decisions that we as governments especially right now are making, either collectively or individually, can have and probably will have a huge and significant impact on the future of the internet as we know it. On the IGF's role, we are um, very supportive of the productive role that the IGF plays in bringing together stakeholders and discussing these issues. And we would be very supportive of having the IGF in Poland next year continue this conversation, perhaps even broadening it if possible. That would be a many sessions, I'm afraid to other sorts of online content issues, if appropriate. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think that the 
a race for censorship or criminalize the speech is not the, the, the best or the better response. We must be strict in the definition of what kind of expression is protected under international law and what kind of expression that incite violence uh, or terrorism is not protected. And this is the, a narrow uh, tailored definition that we need to take decision uh, in terms of take down or or to uh, ban this, this kind of, of, of information. And, and also I agree that we don't uh, move uh, to traspass all the, all the responsibility for that platform to take, that, take down or, or, or address the problem. Uh, I think that the different actors we need to, uh, uh, to build in a multi-stakeholder approach for this uh, issue and a, a, contra, a counter narrative uh, in, in fact, and also to denounce the, the, the you know, the interest use of this narrative uh, by many governments uh, to, you know, uh, persecute uh, dissidents or, or uh, you know, uh, legitimate uh, protests. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Uh, what I think the discussion shows is that there, there are subtle but important differences in perspective among a whole range of actors. Um, but we, we did have a civilized discussion about them. So a forum like the IGF that brings these stakeholder groups together is a really helpful checking in point in a forum for discussion. Um, and it may be that we can't come to global agreement about how to deal with these things, but um, we can be better informed about the approaches that we are taking and through that come to a better understanding and keep the dialogue going. So I don't think we fixed the issue, but uh, I don't think that was our job. Um, thank you to all the panelists for taking the time out to be here today. Thank you to um, Susan, Sylvia, and Yuta who put this together on the MAG side of things. And thank you all for participating, and let's go off and get some lunch. Thank you. <laughs> if we, if